Hello. Everyone's filing in. Welcome. Welcome to the 646th New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, a Programs Associate here at the Brooklyn Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Pamela patsumo Sundstrom and Yasi Alipur. We are so thrilled to welcome poet Diana Ho here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenape Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for actual necessary decolonial work, but a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustained and enriched the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Born in Botswana in 1980, Pamela Patsimo Sundstrom's multidisciplinary practice encompasses drawing, painting, installation, and animation. Her work alludes to mythology, geology, and theories on the nature of the universe. Iranian artist, writer, and folder Yasi Alipur currently lives in Brooklyn and wonders about paper, counting, and silence. She received her MFA from Columbia. Columbia University and is a faculty at Columbia Parsons and SBA New York. Um, thank you all so much for joining today. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Yassi. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, it's very exciting uh, to be back uh, and seeing how these conversations have continued since day one and how much has happened, 600 something. Um, it's been interesting. It's been, Pamela, thank you so much for being here. I've kind of been moving to think about in putting together the questions and the process for this interview. A lot just came. I feel like Pamela's work uh, explores a lot of the questions, desires, um, urgent thoughts, uh, and imaginative hopes that a lot of us carry. And then this morning, I realized that perhaps the hardest part of all of this is to think about an intro. Uh, there's a lot in Pamela's resume that I could read or discuss or uh, a lot of different ways to talk about who she is and everything that makes her work wonderful. But I feel like there's a lot in her work that doesn't fit in the language that we share in rooms like this. Uh, so it is a pleasure to say Pamela's show is currently at Gallery Lalong. I hope all of you make time to spend time with the work, to have some silence, to feel its urgency, uh, to hear its stories. Um, it blew my mind away. Uh, Pamela, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for this invitation. It really means a lot to be here. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, I have a lot of questions or rambling thoughts and I really uh, look forward to where it's gonna take us. Carolyn, if you wanna share a screen, I think we can just like, dig in. Uh, I want to make sure uh, I'm considerate of everyone's time. Uh, so Paula, I figured perhaps a good place for us to start uh, is two elements it seems to be very core to your practice. Uh, you worked with many different mediums uh, and you've researched in a very broad way, but I feel like these are two elements that comes back in your work or the things that to me seem really important and I'm really moved by the way you engage with them. Uh, the first being storytelling and the other being uh, drawing. I wanted to start mm -hmm. with asking you about storytelling. Uh, you did this wonderful interview two days ago with Larry Lalong, and that recording is also available online. Um, but there you kind of talked about cleaving or cutting. Uh, me, when I was going through, especially with this show, and as I was going through this exhibition, I was thinking a lot about weaving. And I wondered, I wondered why I'm thinking about weaving or braiding. And I think there's something about the hands and the care, maybe something about the patterns and repetition or how your layers work. But that seems very specific to this uh, exhibition too. And I must say, I love the title. I have withheld much more than I have written. Uh, so that's my rambling way of asking, can you tell us about storytelling? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think I've, I've 
always used my work um, to tell stories. So I think that's what I've primarily been interested in as a maker uh, has been, um, yeah, about, about kind of adding to our, our ongoing mythologies, I guess. Yeah. And um, I think you're sort of shaping the question around uh, your observation of cleaving and cutting and splicing and weaving. I think that is a really useful way to think about the ways that I build the story in my work or build stories in my work. Um, I think in a private way, I think of the narrative in my work as, as one ongoing narrative, that all of these figures have begotten each other or have been begotten from some previous iteration of, of themselves, uh, the landscapes and now the kind of domestic spaces that they occupy are all very specific and known to me in one way or another. Um, but I think um, that kind of personal lexicon of references as I build this story, or the fact that I know it to be one ongoing saga isn't so important um, for the viewer. I think that that I maybe use a kind of language that is perhaps more universal or more kind of widely recognizable um, in kind of borrowing or referencing across cultures and across histories as a way of kind of opening up what I think of as a kind of a, a story that is known to me so that others may find something of themselves or something recognizable um, in the stories that I tell too. So there's a, yeah, there's a, there isn't a kind of a, a one story, but I suppose it's sort of broken up into many smaller iterations of, of this story to kind of make it yeah, to extend it out into space, I think. Amazing. And Carolyn, I promised I would do this and I instantly forgot. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. <laughs> Might forget again. Um, this is Because this is one of the first pieces you have in the show too. And I yeah. remember I was walking by and I was like, there's like, I'm like, you're up to something. Yeah. <laughs> I remember even like after my third round, um, and it's interesting, we briefly talked about this in our pre-check yesterday, uh, but in your work, I think a lot about Trinity Minha uh, and her writing on woman, native other and grandma stories. Mm -hmm. So it's been very interesting for me that even though our lived experiences and histories perhaps are very different, some of these stories mm -hmm. are very familiar and we're kind of always in the middle, like something is opening. So yeah. the other thing that, uh, I wanted to ask you was about drawing. It's something that is very dear to me, whether it's my practice or just like reading, writing, thinking about art. Um, and it has been continuous with your practice. Mm -hmm. uh, I was reading somewhere that uh, a lot of in, for a long time, your practice was like on paper or even on wall and took a while like to kind of find the wood panels. And this mm -hmm. is one of the pieces in the show that is on a wood panel. And there's something about like I kept wondering why your exhibition makes me think so much about drawing. Is mm -hmm. it is it the line? Is it the forms? Is it kind of the marks, like kind of the care that you have with your marks? But there's something that I got to with this one where it's like it feels like I can feel the surface of the wood mm -hmm. that it's like we're kind of on it, but also slightly like you can feel the pressure that is on the wood or the wood the way mm -hmm. the wood holds it. I was thinking that it kind of feels like note taking or writing on a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, can you tell us about drawing, please? Yeah, I th for sure. I um, I oh, I've always defined my practice as based in drawing, or I say that it is drawing, even beyond it sort of looking like drawing anymore. I know that a lot of the work, especially in this show, is really rooted in a kind of sincere. My finding a kind of sincere language in painting which has been mm -hmm. something that I've kind of been dancing around for a few years. Um, but mm -hmm. the, yeah, uh, as you say, mark making and line and the kind of provisionality that is built into the act of drawing has always mm -hmm. been really, really important to me that the kind of mutability, the uh, layering of gesture mm -hmm. upon the surface the uh, inability to sort of completely erase um, any mm -hmm. mark or, or line are all of these kind of create this mystery in the surface of a drawing that I've always found so fascinating and 
um, I think may, the fascination is mainly because it connects so directly to a, to the body uh, mm. making it. So certainly, I guess you could find that in any medium. I don't think that the presence of the artist's body is is necessarily more visible in drawing, but I think that there's an immediacy to the mark that is so quickly or becomes so quickly idiosyncratic to an artist that that makes it this like quite vulnerable language, this quite revealing language for an artist to kind of leave. And um, yeah, I think there's something uh, in the honesty and the kind of urgency of, of drawing that that has always appealed to me. And and with most things in my practice, there's always kind of a dual meaning or a double use of, of meaning in my work. So there's the kind of technical, physical quality of drawing that I just described, but then, then there's also kind of the sort of political or even economical uh, implications of drawing that it is this sort of trivial medium in a way that it is um, often done on cheaper materials or as much more accessible materials. It is something that we all um, have some experience of that even if you don't have formal training in, in the arts, I think everyone has the experience of picking up a tool and, and using it to, to make a mark into a surface. And so there, there is that, um, yeah, that sort of accessibility of the drawn line that I find fascinating. Um, and then, and and uh, I'm curious about um, what the, the the sort of shift to to the wood panel was was mm -hmm. at first I think a a kind of a function a need for a certain kind of surface that could hold up more than paper that the fragility of paper was was really important to me in the beginning uh, it related so closely to to the content of the work that I was kind of then and still now thinking about bodies and um, skin and vulnerability and kind of bodily violence and um, protection and paper really lent itself to a, a lot of those ideas around skin and body and fragility and um, I sort of began to really push the, the limits of the surface of paper and looking for kind of stronger and stronger paper <laughs> and moving on to the wall as you mentioned, in order to kind of find a support that could withstand um, a lot more. And um, I felt really hesitant to move to canvas because uh, again, I was sort of confronting, trying to find meaning in this history of, or this Western art history of painting that I wasn't quite sure I wanted to take a bite of yet. And so the wood panel became the surface that was the most closely related to paper in its smoothness and its flatness and then was just could able, was able to withstand much more erasing, much more kind of scraping back, much more building up. Um, and so it became a, a surface that I really enjoyed working with. And over the years of working with it, I think working on wood panel made me even think more kind of architecturally about the way the drawing sits in space that, mm. um, yeah, kind of seeing edges and angles and corners, um, it starts to kind of embed these images into uh, space, whether it's like suggesting domestic space or kind of speaking back to the institutional space of the gallery or the museum. So yeah, it, it kind of goes in all, in all directions from there. I'm like, I should have expected this. You're kind of blowing my mind. I'm like, damn, I have like more questions in the middle of a question, which is, uh, I think, dreamy. Uh, Hmm. Yeah, and it was interesting. I feel like something that was really moving about that piece as a starting point is as layered as it is, there's something light about it. There's mm -hmm. something about like how one can feel like they're moving through the layers as they mm -hmm. become one, it doesn't feel like a heavy surface. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because I feel like that quality repeats in the show, whether it is works on the wood panels or canvas. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting when you used the word vulnerability. I have just finished Bell Hooks, uh, All About mm -hmm. Love. Yes. It's kind of in the end, she kind of talks about the past, like the importance of vulnerability as kind of a shared yes. experience. And I feel like your exhibition really invites us into a space that is safe and vulnerable. And I think that can mm -hmm. be really important and rare, especially mm -hmm. for BIPOC femme audiences, mm -hmm. uh, both safe and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um I, okay I'm going to move to my other question because um 
uh, I need, uh, I want to be, make sure we leave time for everything. Um, so I was thinking, and this kind of relates to what you were saying with this relationship to uh, these histories uh, or painting, drawing, but also the narratives. Something I really admire about your practice is that you're very clear about citation and ethics of citation. It's something you discuss. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and it's it's a vast world. Sometimes it's literature, a lot of times it's like visual art. Uh, but I was thinking about two people that feel really core to your practice. Uh, one is someone who you've been discussing in your work for a long time, and that's Bessie Het, mm -hmm. uh, the writer. Uh, and in this show, you discuss Duncanson, uh, the painter. And I feel mm -hmm. like they both deal with the history of politics in their time, both in Africa and the US and what it means mm -hmm. to be a racialized body and blackness. But one is a romanticist painter and the other one is a storyteller that tells stories on so many layers where one, mm -hmm. when the notion of reality is pretty complicated, but urgent. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking of those as two people who are always cited in your work or present. Yeah. Um, I, I was I was thinking that can be a way for us to talk about the landscape, the architectures, as you mentioned, the domestic spaces now, the corners in your work and these meetings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah, you're right. Bessie Head has been a, a long time reference for me that uh, she is a South Af was a South African writer who um, whose mother and father were of different races, and so she, uh, because of the laws, um, the system of apartheid that governed South Africa at the time, her very birth was considered a crime. And so there's an entire sort of generation of people who were known as the born of crimes that, um, uh, yeah, that kind of car carries its own legacy. And that's, um, yeah, quite personal to me as well. Um, but Bessie um, lived mainly in exile in Botswana, which is the country where I was born and where my mother's from, and um, did and all of her writing really from a very small village called Soroe, which is um, even, even today still quite a, 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 a rural place and um, shaped really by kind of small town, small community politics, and mm -hmm. then and now perhaps. And um, so the, there's a lot of references in my show, and I guess these two images that we're seeing here would be good examples of, of places where there's sort of a whisper of Bessie Head's writing uh, around my work that she, her, uh, so on the right, we're looking at, as you can see in the title, um, uh, works from my show at Le Long. Um, the right is a piece called Front Room, and on the left is a piece called uh, Walkie Talkie. And um, the piece Front Room, uh, which is itself a citation of another <laughs> painting by Tulmush called The uh, Unhappy Bride. Uh, in my rendering of this, um, again, sort of romanticist painting, there's this central figure who is, I would say, more than a little unhappy, that there's a sort of a brewing rage underneath, uh, barely concealed beneath the surface. And the interaction between the other three women um, is pretty slippery, I tried to make, that there's one on the ground who seems to be sort of pleading for calm, and the one above her sort of insisting on calm. And um, that sort of slippage between the domestic space being a space of comfort and safety, um, but also sometimes it's a space of kind of a, a suppression or cloying, mm -hmm. uh, coddling um, or repression as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Bessie Head's writing with her um, kind of unique position in the community as kind of a, a self, um, a self-chosen, a self-made outsider in many ways. She had this particular vantage point on these sort of fluidities and, and, and stickinesses that happen in these small domestic settings. Um, and similarly, the piece with the bowl of, of chicken heads and feet called the uh, walkie talkie, uh, I think is, is maybe not a direct reference to Bessie Head's writing, but is uh, sits, sits in this, in this 
place that I hope becomes kind of a mode of an insider's language that um, a lot of what Bessie Head leaves out of her writing um, is, is a way of um, inviting kind of a sense of ownership from the reader that we, those who know this landscape or the particular kind of smell of dust in the morning that she describes or the particular way that light works in the evening that she, that she you know, very barely describes, it's a, it's a kind of a wide open invitation to a space that you can feel a sense of ownership over um, for your own, because of your own familiarity with it. And the same with this kind of gruesome bowl of chicken heads and feet that I painted quite um, romantically as well, that on the one hand, it sort of stands as maybe a, you know, a classical uh, still life study uh, and I and I try to kind of give that sort of sense of you know Vermeer's light or you know not to say that I <laughs> manage but the reference is there to a kind of classical um, still life painting and yet the content of it these heads and feet um, being a, a site that would not be particularly familiar to maybe many viewers to this exhibition but to anyone who's attended a family gathering or who knows what it means to kind of cook for a funeral or for a wedding would recognize a bowl of, of, of innards in a kind of beat up enamel dish waiting to be prepared, you know, in a special way. Um, and so I think of, I think of those references as kind of codes. And as I look at this piece on the left, especially, it starts to become a bit of a spell. I think that mm, this kind of reference to, or maybe an opening out to, mm, you know, fetishized idea of the ideas of the occult and blackness or of kind of women's spaces and the occult, I think become a little bit of a kind of elbow to the ribs to sort of insiders who might, who might have the capacity to wonder about that kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. Um, hmm. yeah. It's interesting, as you mentioned, the sense of like, what are the codes and who's it legible for? Mm -hmm. um, something you said about uh, allowing spaces um, for people to read or have a sense of ownership if they're familiar with these scenes, these like daily mm -hmm. domestic uh, kind of lived experiences. Um, the thing I find really interesting in your work in relationship to citation is also thinking about uh, the parts of our histories that are much harder or more complicated to cite. Mm -hmm. Uh, to think about erasure, to think about stories that I've been wondering, I keep wondering if like the oral tradition is not enough to describe what has not mm -hmm. been written, uh, what has refused to be archived, what has refused mm -hmm. to be captured. And it's been really interesting for me to think about how these moments are also cited in your work, mm -hmm. where there's a, there's a relationship to silence and storytelling that I feel mm -hmm. like is very special unique in your practice uh, that you kind of create these spaces that we can enter and wonder about or perhaps it's related how well in we travel in and out these different layers mm -hmm. um I want I'm curious to know more of your thoughts about this relationship to silence but also citation that is beyond the histories that we learn like the western histories of painting uh mm -hmm. even literature uh and it seems like Bessie Head thinks a lot mm -hmm. about that uh in different ways so sometimes it's an intergenerational like bringing in but also especially with these this show I feel like there's many moments where uh the show prioritizes viewers that might feel feel internally uh the intimacy of these moments or mm -hmm. or the complexity of these silences i'm yeah. stepping back give me some thought. yeah no i think <laughs> i think it, i think that really the title of the show and which was a, a line taken from dion brand's um blue clark it was a line that you know you ever I think anybody who has read anything that touches you you stumble upon that that line or that phrase that kind of makes you close the book for a second you know that it's just too close it's too much it's too exactly kind of drawn from <laughs> your most gooey heart 
And that <laughs> line was exactly it. I have withheld much more than I have written because I think it speaks to, um, yeah, the not enoughness. <laughs> The not enoughness uh, in terms of the spaces in which we can feel soft or feel vulnerable enough to kind of be much more nuanced in our unpacking of our histories. I think I spoke about this a little bit on Saturday um, in the gallery, but that there is a lot of room for a particular kind of narrative when it comes to um, the, the work of artists who look like me or who come from places like I do, artists of the global south, women, IPOC and queer. There's a certain, there's a tolerance for a certain kind of story, I think, and anything more complicated or more nuanced or more, or, or that brings along new implications, I think becomes, um, yeah, much more trickier to kind of pull out. And I think that often gets relegated to this place of silence that the loudest mm -hmm. stories, uh, the most obvious platforms, the most visible stories are the ones that that um, are e maybe not easily digestible, but, but ready to be digested and um, pre-tested mm -hmm. in a certain way for their, for their hit. <laughs> and I think, um, yeah, what I what I wonder about often is the is the the places where there's not room, where um, uh, where certain specificities become inconvenient to larger um, histories, even if even larger radical histories. That something mm -hmm. I think interesting about the last couple of years, uh, through and post, not even post, but through COVID the kind of global uh, isolation that we experienced was isolating, but also really revealing in, in that it opened a lot of new communities. It, it opened a lot of voices for a lot of new communities and this sudden rush of a, realiz a realization of how maybe not alone we may be. Um, and yet concomitantly, there was this kind of rush of a realization of how, um, yeah, how co how quickly co-opted those safe spaces can become, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and uh, and a, a, a kind of a surprise in the limits uh, of how broadly we can think radically about um, the politics around our bodies, and mm -hmm. so where I think there's a lot of people who kind of find you know this this beautiful new word that the youth have given us of kind of interest uh, this word intersectionality i think encompasses mm -hmm. something that that was kind of on the tip of our tongues maybe a generation or two before but now kind of reveals the heart of it that this mm -hmm. um slicing and splicing of ourselves reveals the mm -hmm. kind of insufficiencies of the of this language to sort of define us but also these systems that we look to to even you know improve our situation uh, and it's yeah it's in those omissions and those silences in those um yeah sort of erasures whether they are deliberate or kind of inadvertent mm -hmm. that that i'm curious it's a it's a it's a place that i um recognize you know quite intimately actually mm. yeah it's interesting it was uh, as you were saying I was kind of thinking about the marks or the things that feel like the, the drawing element of your work. It's like mm -hmm. kind of the marks that remain, but even like for those who will spend time with it, it's kind of like, as, mm -hmm. as you said, it also feels like marks um, on a skin mm -hmm. or a body. Mm -hmm. um, I was mentioning this before and it was really moving for me. I found this text that is uh, from a work of yours that is much earlier. Mm -hmm. um, the Disruptors, uh, which is an mm -hmm. anti-opera you did, I think around eight years ago. It's much yeah. more performative. There's a lot of elements of installation, which I think all of that is still very present in your work. It's also deeply involved in this question of storytelling or asking people to be in the middle, but also mm -hmm. what it means to engage with these archives, mm -hmm. uh, to imagine the possibility of archives. And it has a kind of a sci-fi element to it, which is also really mm -hmm. core to your practice. But the thing I wanted to go to, uh, you have this beautiful writing, it's like a kind of an academic writing, uh, you and collab your collaborator, you write about that performance. Mm -hmm. um, and you kind of talk about the characters and kind yeah. of the main character is an anti-hero. And you kind mm -hmm. of discuss why it's important for that person to be an anti-hero. Mm -hmm. And then there's an antagonist, there's a sense of running and like kind of the sci-fi story. Yeah. And I was thinking about kind of 
confusing to have a binary of like a good and a bad that it's like there's mm-hmm. an anti-hero and there's definitely an antagonist but mm-hmm. as I kept reading you kind of discuss this other figure in the narrative if there's kind of the giantess mm-hmm. or uh, this ancestor oracle figure mm-hmm. and sometimes I was very sensitive about how we use the word ancestor because I feel mm-hmm. like it's one of those words that we're starting to lose because we're yes. using it pretty mm-hmm. often these days uh, but for me it was interesting suddenly I was very aware that there's at least three characters and in your work mm-hmm. there's a lot of doubly well first there was this alter ego as me or as me mm-hmm. that kind of was your body in these stories and then there was mm-hmm. the sisters now you have different kinds of elders there's a lot mm-hmm. of doubling echoing twinning and and I'm constantly wondering like what is the right verb uh like Mm -hmm. what is this existing um but yeah and and there you kind of talk about the importance of like kind of claiming the space of being anti Mm -hmm. especially as someone who's lived in different places Mm -hmm. his experience of code switching also speaks of this moment um can you kind of uh I'm curious to know about like how much of that still resonates yeah. and like what it means to tell these stories where there's a lot of different echoes mm-hmm. that you're listening to yeah yeah the Disruptor X project was one that I worked on for a few years with a very dear friend and sister and collaborator named Tenjue Nikki and Kosi she's a a painter and a filmmaker and an an artist who has a, a really profound uh, kind of social justice element to her practice, who I met when I was living in Johannesburg. And uh, we had this idea for uh, really a, a way to play together, that our practices were were very, were quite different. Um, we were sharing a, a creative space together. And we, you speak of this third body, we wanted to kind of explore this idea of collaboration that would, mm-hmm. uh, sort of bring forth a third a third body so that we didn't want to necessarily blend or combine our practices. We wanted our practices to remain distinct and that there be kind of a third place for us to explore these ideas that we tackle in really different ways, but are very present in both of our practices. And so we were invited in 2015 or so, or maybe even earlier, 2014, um, to this very interesting archive of African art and literature and culture in Bayreuth called the Eva Leva House. And it's a quite a strange um, archive of um, sound recordings, music, film, pop culture, textile, um, craft, art, both kind of real and not real, <laughs> uh, all, all housed in this um, big uh, building in the middle of the Bavarian countryside in Germany. And so we were invited um, through the work of Sam Hopkins, who was trying to engage this archive in a project that he called Mash Up the Archive, where he invites artists to do just that, really kind of confront the, 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 the complexities and all of the kind of uh, pro- problematic elements of this weird archive. And um, So we took this opportunity to invent this uh, anti-opera and we use this word anti, uh, I think in a kind of Deleuzean sense that we were were thinking a lot about Deleuze's ideas on becoming and that once a thing is kind of fixed in its naming, as you said about this word ancestry, it kind of loses all of its power. So the power is always in, in, in staying in that state of becoming, of being kind of always unnameable, always kind of unfixed, always in a, in a state of flux. And so we invented this hero who could never be a hero, would always kind of be becoming a hero or be kind of in the, in the downfall after being a hero <laughs> in a hero who goes on this quest. We used... Um, these we tried in the archive to find what we call the outliers. So all of these strange objects that may or may not really have origins in Africa, objects with kind of no real provenance, objects that were duplicates of original objects, objects that were like clearly sort of tourist art mixed in with you know real artifacts. Um, so we tried to pick those weirdos in the in the collection and then 
kind of elevated them to characters in our pantheon as well. And I think all of that, whether it's um, deliberately uh, misrepresenting or misciting things, deliberately misunderstanding mm -hmm. the archive, um, occupying the archive in a kind of transgressive way, taking um, possession of material, taking repossession of material, um, and trying to kind of recontextualize it, cutting and pasting, remixing, um, all of that is still, all of those, I think, parts that came alive in, in this collaboration really are still uh, in my practice quite a bit that, um, you know, I'm not, I, I, I often refer to my practice as citational um, to Tavia Gary and Colleen Smith and, uh, you know, many other artists, I think, working in, in this moment to Kwasi Dyson would also describe their practices as citational, that there's it's a power move to kind of stand in your statement and kind of underneath each foot have, you know, your stack, your stacks of, of, uh, of citation to kind of um, give root to or give um, weight to uh, your own voice. Um, so yeah, I, th I, think, I think that's where I would see that kind of performative collaborative work um, still operating in my images now. Yeah, that makes me think I was, um, I was discussing this with some dear friends, but uh, the importance of having our elders in the room and how they give us mm -hmm. permission. I feel like some of our job is to bring them in, even mm -hmm. when they're being ignored or denied. Um, mm -hmm. Something I found really profound or moving in your work, I feel like there's these spaces or shifting that happens where I was just thinking whether I can what is the space between abstraction and figuration in your work? And it feels mm -hmm. like there's many in-betweens. There's the shadows, the foliage, the architecture, the landscape, the bodies, uh, the animals, the doublings, where it's like they all emerge together or like are mm -hmm. braided in different ways. Yeah. Um, which I feel like it kind of, if we think outside of the, Kind of limited western history of art there is always that space where these things are much more closer or intertwined or perhaps mm -hmm. these separations don't make as much uh, sense um, but to kind of thinking about figuration or bodies in your work it's been really interesting hearing you talk about there's the part of you that has done a lot of research you've done some academic museum work you also have a background in dance and I feel like both of them really come together in your mm -hmm. practice um and you kind of talk about how the place of bodies especially your body in your work there was a moment where um you kind of stepped away from figuration mm -hmm. you kind of discuss how your body how bodies came back mm -hmm. and then you kind of talk about how important it was to think about the place of your body in the work thinking mm -hmm. that if there are bodies on the line then what in the importance of implicating yourself or standing in that space. Uh, mm. Can you tell us a bit about bodies? Yeah, yeah. I think I, I um, as I said, I would. I have always been trying to tell stories in my work, and so it always felt sort of both necessary and very natural for their for the work to be quite figurative. And I mm. think around the time that I moved to Johannesburg, so this was sort of early two thousands. I um, yeah, I think confronted by a sudden return to a home place and uh, how fraught that experience can sometimes be. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it had such a transformational impact on my work. And I suddenly in the kind of throng of it all felt really suspicious of my reliance on the figure mm -hmm. in telling stories. And I think the, the placidness that I felt really palpably when I arrived um, mm -hmm. to Joburg was was kind of inescapable that I that I the city and uh, the the landscape nature the suburbs the, and the layers upon layers of history that's really embedded mm -hmm. in kind of every corner of the city made me kind of suddenly realize that this idea of place in my work had always had become uh sort of hardly a reference anymore. And so um, that and, and this sort of, uh, at the same time I was invited to do a really um, interesting exhibition at Mokada curated by 
Kalia Brooks at the time, and it was uh, an exhibition on um, the scientific aesthetic. A mm -hmm. And so she paired each artist with a scientist uh, or the work of a scientist. In my case, I was paired with Dr. Sylvester Gates, who's this theoretical physicist. And it kind of opened this new language in drawing to me, reading his work, which I had absolutely no business reading because this was advanced quantum physics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but And so it, it was literally a case of kind of enjoying the pictures very much and, <laughs> and rather than really understanding the content of his, of his work in a profound way that, um, yeah, I started to allow myself to explore abstraction and a kind of, yeah, mathematical or diagrammatic uh, aesthetic or language in in with my drawing language and so for for some years actually um, there was this kind of um, yeah graphic nature to the work very much about mapping and um, mm -hmm. dimensions or uh, planes of information I was starting to allow myself to explore landscape really sincerely and much more specifically um, and I was curious about the possibility of continuing to tell the story without relying on, on the figure. And so mm -hmm. there were references to human intervention in the landscape, little built structures or ruins or kind of smoking fires in the distance or little flags to signal marks in the landscape, but no actual bodies. Um, until I became a mom. And that's what I kind of always talk about as being the moment that bodies came crashing back into the work that that experience of um, yeah carrying a baby and giving birth to it uh, comes with um, a huge flood of knowledge about your body that uh, is overwhelming and surprising and mysterious and sacred and profane <laughs> at the same time and um, yeah, it became undeniable that that the figure would sort of really be, continue to be a central part of my work. What's interesting, I think, about the work in this show, though, is that, uh, and maybe in the work leading up to this show, too, that there are a lot of figures in the work, but then there are a lot of absences of figures in the work, too, that there are a lot of ap uh, empty chairs um, mm -hmm. or... Um, uh, sort of the, the implication of a figure that has maybe just left or is just about to enter uh, that, I, that I leave space for too. So, you know, I, I feel like it could continue to be something that kind of ebbs and flows in the work that there's, it's amazing to still be able to reference a figure without using it directly. Yeah, it, it, it was interesting. There was this moment uh, when I was, uh, um, going through your exhibition where people were talking about this one piece there's like foliage but there is a body kind of in the midst mm -hmm. and they were mm -hmm. like wait where's the body you know mm -hmm. and someone was like I found the body and it's like yeah. it's like kind of that search and there yes. is that kind of really moving piece there's an empty chair and a coat and mm -hmm. it's asymmetrical mm -hmm. unfortunately don't have it in this light show but people should go and see the, like see the show <laughs> yeah uh, <laughs> But it's like, a reference there for me to to um, I was just thinking about it as I was sitting in the gallery, um, mm -hmm. looking through Anna Mendieta's work again, that her, mm -hmm. especially her earthworks, which are this kind of ongoing uh, insistence on the presence of a body, even even as the earth tries to kind of consume it or erase it. And and even her more. Um, kind of confrontational performance pieces in her apartment uh, where she really put her own body and the violence that her own body experienced out on the line. I, I think about that when I think about presence and absence of, of figure and that, that there's so much in kind of a smear of hands or a kind of thumbprint or a kind of wiped away line that's, that still insists on the presence of a body. How beautiful. You brought Autumn and Dieta to the room. Like, <laughs> your presence. Like, things are getting real. Um, well, and it's interesting. I feel like I, I was reading something. I don't know if you have this experience. Sometimes reading kind of Western theories of art, I get very easily frustrated because I feel like mm -hmm. the histories I think about are just like completely pushed on the outside or it's like yes. taken out of the imagination. 
there's mm -hmm. kind of that moment of me yelling at a piece of paper. Um, yes. But I started kind of noticing that sometimes, especially in English, we use the the term figuration and representation interchangeably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas in my head, the figuration Very is different. a completely mm -hmm. different space or a vast space where it can mm -hmm. be the print of the body, it could be a element to tell stories, it could be mark making, it can be a mapping. So I was mm -hmm. thinking about what are the possibilities of thinking about figuration beyond uh, representation. And with that, it started, I started thinking, especially in my case, thinking about history of art in the Middle East, thinking about abstraction as a narrative space. Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of times we take that out. I came and saw your show and I was like, Pamela's messing with me. Like <laughs> it's here, like that sense of um, how narrative aren't necessarily yeah um it, it's been very moving to look at your work and how deeply um you engage with it and to the point that it almost feels effortless uh, mm -hmm. that it isn't um perhaps that's what's that sense of like bringing people to the room where it's like yeah mm -hmm. like it, it feels like there's a long lineage which was why mm -hmm. it was also really moving to think about Anna Mendieta um uh, mm -hmm. in this moment uh I know I don't have much of a question, but I'd be curious to know your thoughts. Yeah. Um, yeah, sort of figuration and representation. I think, I think that um, it's such a, maybe it's such a cliche to say now, but it, it is sincerely a driving force in my practices. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's something that's come with some maturity that I really do make things because I want to see what it looks like. I know that that's kind of the cliche that artists <laughs> should be doing that, but uh, but it's really sincere that there's a kind of a pursuit, um, a, a kind of curiosity in that really drives my work. I think the image that we're looking at now is maybe a good example of that. That the mm -hmm. the, the show also includes this um, animation that um, I've actually that's kind of been weirdly simmering in the cauldron for several years that I that I made these these photos um, you know almost five years ago now and have made reference to them have made drawings of them have used them in paintings and in other little snippets and it wasn't until this show that I had this kind of firm knowledge that that these figures were, were going to be kind of brought out in this very direct way that the thing that I was referencing which was photography and particularly studio portrait photography and histories of representation um, I wanted that to kind of be the, the like instruction room that introduces the show uh, and to really mess with that all, all of that um, uh, kind of fetishization, that construct of the other, that propping up of the empire, the ways that image and image making and world making um, served to um, fuel and justify the, the project of the British Empire or, or any kind of colonial empire for that matter. Um, that I, I wanted to kind of finally put my thumb on it and say, yeah, this this is what it this is also what it is. Um, uh, that it that it's beyond uh, like that the ideas around representation go much deeper than a certain number of a certain kind of face you know being visible that that it is about um, really pointing out the those cleavage points those like mm -hmm. uh, suture points where one ideology one history one system of power cuts directly through real soft living bodies and then must be melded in whatever way, shape or form to the very next uh, system of power uh, <laughs> that, that, that comes along. And those suture points, I think, um, become really interesting to me. And that's why, yeah, this kind of language of citation, this language of collage mm -hmm. is so much a part of the way I think about bodies and, and the figure mm, that, uh, and, and I think that's, you, you, we talked about sort of the romanticist paintings, Robert S. Duncanson mm -hmm. and other really kind of frequent references to the sublime in my work. Uh, I, I think that's how I use beauty. I use beauty to be 
kind of the drug that like lures you in and then immediately something uncomfortable starts to happen. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I like to think of the politic in my work as being kind of really subtle, like a scream underwater, like there is something um, really dangerous about what these figures might be saying. If only we knew if they were really saying that is the question that I hope kind of keeps, mm -hmm. keeps uh, in, like nagging at you as you look at the work. You know, as someone who is um, kind of a fan of cyclical things, mm -hmm. brought the cleaving back, you know? Yeah, and yeah. Like, and, and, and silence, and we even like kind of mm -hmm. step even a step further. Um, mm -hmm. Carolyn, can we go to the, the one with the goat? Because I love that one. Uh, it's coming, it's yeah. coming. Um, I just wanna make sure I, that we have space to talk about this because it's been interesting. I feel like in our kind of anti-existence as Global South people, as kind of histories of subjugation, mm -hmm. we sometimes have to spend all our time kind of talking uh, in relationship to with like powers that erase. Something mm -hmm. I found really moving about your work or kind of breathtaking about this exhibition uh, is just thinking, I was thinking about care, I was thinking about rest, mm -hmm. I was thinking about joy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to hear your thoughts on those. I don't have yeah. a question. Yeah, I think, I think um, I'm, I'm really, super, it's good to talk about that question with this work because this work was really surprising for me that, um, you know, when I, I, my images often kind of come in a flash in my mind and then the rest of the time is just to kind of scramble <laughs> just to try to find that thing in real life. And so the flash of an image that came before this, this painting was much more violent that I thought about mm -hmm. this kind of a strangulation or a kind of a squeezing, a kind of a, yeah, a real, a real tension, a real co conflict between these two figures and where, where care becomes kind of over, overpowering. And, and yet, you know, undeniably the little lamb's face <laughs> became so tender and the, the, it then just kind of drove this figure to kind of hold it in this very tender way. And I just kind of let go of the struggle for one second, you know, I just let go of, of all of the fight for a bit and let this really be, um, yeah, this kind of gesture of tenderness with you know the kind of bittersweet there, I think you know this this poor six-legged lamb. You know, there's an idea that it's never meant for this world. You know that it's not maybe meant to last or not even meant to be. And I think there's mm -hmm. something really familiar about that, about kind of occupying uh, spaces or occupying bodies that may or may not have meant to be. And mm -hmm. uh, the undeniable care, nevertheless, you know that there is rest and respite and tenderness, um, you know, became really important to me. And I, and I think that's another kind of lesson of, the, of these um, very fraught and uh, <laughs> turbulent times that we're surviving at the moment that, um, you know, I think I, I, I thought a lot about Sonia Renee Taylor's work um, around bodies. I think she wrote, The Body is Not an Apology. And, mm -hmm. um, Trisha Hershey's um, work that she's the founder of the NAP ministry, thinking mm -hmm. so much about rest and tenderness as radicality that um, for a long time, I thought about imagination and the kind of act of imagining as, as, a, as a radical political act. And I, I think that there is something, you know, fundamentally radical, anti-capitalist, anti-supremacist about taking rest, about being soft, as well as being, you know, as hard and strong as we've had to be this whole time. That, um, yeah, I really wanted to make space for that, not only in the image that I made, but um, really in my practice. And, um, you know, that, that brings forward kind of a lot of, a lot of maybe uncertainty or fear, especially in this climate of kind of hustle culture and the, the you know, the myths around, um, success as an artist and this uh, trap of constant visibility uh, that, um, you know, when I, when I started to kind of investigate the ways that um, 
yeah, supremacy and capitalism had worked its way even into my most, what I thought was my most kind of private practice in my studio, uh, it really gave me pause. And um, yeah, we spoke, you spoke earlier about bell hooks and love that, um, yeah, that, that, that there's uh, something very ferocious, I think about, about finding space for rest and mm. love and tenderness. Mm. Especially uh, when was, everything tells us not to, like when everything else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. well, it's true. Uh, yeah, it feels like we're constantly asked to perform or like mm -hmm. almost as labor or anger uh, mm -hmm. or mourning or grief. Yeah. Um, and never given space to actually discuss like joy mm -hmm. and rest. I was wondering yesterday if you followed the nap ministry. I I went to Instagram yeah. and I was like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, I think her work is very and it was, important. Yes. Um, and shout out, it is on Instagram. Everyone can mm -hmm. follow. There's also books, but mm -hmm. um, you know, it's really interesting in your some of your recent interviews, I was kind of noticing like someone was interviewing you and they were like, well, you've definitely have emerged. Like you have the mm -hmm. exhibition, you know? Mm -hmm. And in, in a conversation you were kind of asking, it's like, am I emerging? Have I emerged? Mm -hmm. and, and I was just thinking about how much of that reminds me of my experience of immigration and assimilation yes. and kind of always being in the space that is permanent and you have to perform. Mm -hmm. I feel very grateful that your work is in New York and we can spend time with it and it's given space and I feel like it's really special for all of us to experience it um yeah Thanks so much. okay I'm gonna st step back because I want to make sure everyone gets asked their questions uh but Pamela thank you so much for your work for all the ways you surround it for all the things you make possible for the ways you imagine and for today thank you Oh yeah, thank you both so much. Um, I can't believe the hour <laughs> went by so quickly actually. Um, so we have, yeah, a couple of questions. Um, the first one, I'm gonna turn it over to our friend G.E. Schwartz you can go ahead and unmute. Okay, hello, am I? Yeah, yes, am I unmuted? Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, it, it seems so much watching this today and thank you so much for this conversation it seems so much that your art is is seems to be about telling the narratives of all our others you know those compartmentalizations the disruptions that they experience and certainly our fragmentations because after all we we all sort of contain all of our others is is there any way that this is true of your work and and how so i i thank you yeah. Thank you so much. That is such a good question. Uh, and I love that phrase, all of our others. Um, and as you're asking it, what came to mind uh, to me was just things I've thought about around um, DNA and genetics and kind of genetic material as archive as well. And, um, you know, may maybe some of these ideas came became stronger again, as I say, when I became a mom, but certainly even before that, um, be before I kind of gave myself permission to begin <laughs> to pursue art, I was uh, on a much more sort of science-based track in my studies. I was studying to become a doctor eventually. And yet what I found kind of the most interesting in, in my studies were, were, were these kind of comparative anatomy, anatomy classes that, that became almost sort of a poetic reading of how our bodies are now, where you could trace lineages in every kind of body part to any other kind of living creature that has ever been. And this kind of compounding of material uh, that is then inextricable, like when, whenever is it, is it not in everything? you know, <laughs> became such a rich uh, thing to think about. And um, yeah, I, I, I would say that's, that's yeah, very much at the, at the heart of my work. Thank you, Pamela. Thank, Thank you, you GE. Um, our next question will be from Raven. Um, and I just wanna encourage everyone once more to, if you do have a question, please put it in the chat um, for us, but go ahead, Raven, you can ask. So um, my question is, uh, what would you tell yourself back when you were just starting your career? And what advice would you give an artist who's scared to take the next step in their own creative journey? 
Oh man, the, the best and hardest question. <laughs> yeah, okay, if I were to meet my younger self, um, it's, it's such a shame, but it's all the things that you know I'm gonna say. It's gonna be, um, there's no rush. Like maybe that's the very first thing. And maybe that's a, that is maybe a bit cliche, but never not worth emphasizing because I think everything in the art world at the moment is on an accelerated pace that is unrealistic, that is damaging, that is destructive to creativity. This idea of kind of constantly hustling and constantly extracting content from, from your very pure mana to me is just uh, really damaging, I think. And so the idea that um, there is the pace of the hustle and, the, and then there are also other paces that you can pursue and you can still get where you want to get to without, um, yeah, without the breakneck speed, I think I would say that. And I think, um, I think to, to um, listen to your own lessons, I think that's another, <laughs> another thing that I would say that, you know, in, in addition to this kind of super fast um, social media driven art world that we have to navigate at the moment, there are, there is a plethora of inexperienced experts <laughs> who, who would try to sort of lead you astray and, and, and put you on a, on a path to success that may or may not be yours. And I think like staying, being, and I used to tell my students this when I used to teach a lot more that, that the first thing to kind of think about um, before looking at what success looks like on, to, to others outside of you is to really define what success means to, to you on your own terms. And, and be clear about what um, you are and are not willing to put on the line in order to pursue um, that definition of success. Because um, there's faster ways, you know, I could have done this. <laughs> there are faster ways to get, to get places, you know, and, and, you, and, you pay, and you pay in other ways to get there faster. And um, I think, and this is no judgment, you know, I don't, I don't wanna take it away from um, from hustle culture at, 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 at large. I think it's creating, it's democratizing markets in ways that are really exciting. It's opening um, new spaces for artists to create that are extremely exciting. So, so I'm not, this is not me calling for some ancient you know, method and that's all. Um, I'm just, uh, I guess, inviting you to, um, to uh, yeah, to kind of be truer to, to something a little bit more private and specific to you and, and to kind of honor that, I guess. Um, yeah, and be nice to your body. You're gonna need it for your whole life. That's, that's really something that I would say to every artist too, that um, our labor and our, um, yeah, our minds and our mental health uh, are kind of all we have in the end. And I think we put those, we, we think that those are inexhaustible resources, but yeah, be, 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 I sound like a godmother now. Be nice to your body. <laughs> be, take your time. Don't speed around. <laughs> Use materials that will not kill you. Like, <laughs> just be nice to yourself, basically. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Pamela and Raven, um, for that question. Just have uh, one more here from um, Grace Hong who is curious to hear about what Pamela is going to work on next. Are there any themes or topics that we can look forward to? Yeah, I'm very excited about what's next. There's, um, so in this show, uh, I had the wonderful opportunity to collaborate with my partner in designing this piece of furniture that you saw that supports the animation. And we worked um, really closely looking at Victorian furniture, kind of precursors to, to museums, you know, cabinets of curiosities, but also um, church furniture uh, and other kind of institutions of kind of public betterment or public education, schoolhouses, um, reform schools, residential schools from the Canadian context. So that's kind of what we were we were looking at. And it and it was a really uh, his name is Remco Osorio Lobato and uh, an artist and designer and furniture maker himself. And um, we um, have found some further opportunities to kind of continue thinking about uh, furnishings and sort of built spaces or building spaces within spaces to kind of support and house um, 
my work, whether it is animations or uh, sort of site specific drawings and paintings. So I think I think that's what's what's on the horizon. There's a few. Um, there's a, a really exciting project coming up at the at the um, powerhouse, which is an amazing space in Toronto. We'll be doing a site specific installation there. Um, and uh, yeah, a few other cool places to kind of, oh, and at the Bloomberg in London, there's a really weird and wonderful building there where I'm going to be, um, yeah, building a bit of a kind of intervention in their gallery there to house some uh, animations. Exciting. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, uh, so at the rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm so thrilled to welcome Diana Ho uh, to the stage. Chinese poet Diana Ho is from Queens. She likes to drum, dance, and grow mushrooms. Their work can be found in Pen Pen Press. And I'll turn it over to you, Diana. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Carolyn, and everyone for having me. Um, thank you so much to everyone for this conversation. Um, and I'm excited to help us close up. So this first poem was a response to a prompt, write a love letter to yourself. It's called, You Are Four Months. I had to take a breath, thank you. <laughs> thank you for being there for that. Memory wipes her feet on the doormat, but she is not allowed in. You are four months to cry slow. Your bok choy seedlings curve to gentle death. You eat half a grain of rice and you resent the ant whose belly is full. You scream linen pillow to wood floor. You steam from 10 hours of broth making. You sip from a sliver of journal written in Chinese. You battle dust mites in the cellar to recover your parents. Lost children drop from charcoal skies, bottle of sunlight in hand, patient gold. It is not your job to pour one out. I remember you like a tamarack tree, deciduous and coniferous at the same time. It's okay if sand falls through your palm. You are here despite, you are whole despite. The second poem is called On Scarcity. It's a beaming winter day and dad wears the same beige coat he's worn for 25 years. Legend has it he paired it with a blue scarf the day he landed in New York with two suitcases and $10. He can boil a whole chicken, no salt, no oil. He can charm a table afloat, shudder his beer, Maxime and proverb with blunt force. Our ears know the ring of his empty plate, not knowing how to say yes. He develops intimacy with the plastic over the remote control, allows timid ends to unstick and curl up, capture dust in high definition. It's a stubborn summer night and dad moves to where there are no sidewalks. Maybe he wants to be by the sea again, like in his springtime before America, oysters aplenty and mountains of mussels all ripe at the same time, stand ready in town with your bucket, hoist the mollusk, mollusks home and boil them, crowd around, watch for their silent scream, smear them in vinegar, ginger, soy sauce. Only this time, it's the Long Island Sound and the sea is empty. Thanks for listening. I have two more short little poems. Um, this third one is called Maybe. Clutch my arm like deer rushing the brush, like fragrant trumpets wake up call. Exhale like you did when you realized we were still kicking, wielding dimples as knives, going nowhere in Willy Wonka's great glass elevator.
This last one is called, I will feed you like the waves do. What if I was a surfboard spinning out? Fuck me ocean, splayed row of green fans, feet dug deep in sand, push me all you want, I sway, unencumbered. Pebble shellfish open and close sand tunnels. Another wave will come and the melancholy parched sand, desert pride consistent, cuts a dress from seaweed drapes, tentatively waiting. Thank you, everyone. Wow, oh, thank you so, so much, Diana. Really incredible way to end. Um, thank you, of course, again, endlessly, Pamela, Yassi. Um, we'd like to thank everyone from Gallery Le Long as well. Um, and we would like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC. Um, you can view today's event in our YouTube channel and archive, um, which will be published shortly. Over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has brought together art, music, dance, film, theater, literature, and thoughtful social and political meditations in our monthly publication and our public events, like here in our daily NSC. You can check the chat for a link to donate. Uh, join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a Wednesday afternoon poetry reading, a large poplar at dusk with a gathering storm curated by Kyle Brosnahan. Um, and you can now turn your microphones on and say hi and bye as you leave. Thank you all again so, so much for being here. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. So great. Thank you. Thank you. So awesome. Thanks for Thanks again. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Congratulations, Pamela. And Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank good to see you it. tomorrow. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Yeah. Keep up the good work. Much love and peace. And, Thank you. Uh, Let's go to have lunch. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.